This is the Carl Gerber Workplace Lawyer Show being broadcast live from the Employment Lawyers Group Sherman Oaks with a proud appreciation for the Southern California Association of Broadcasters. Tonight, we're going to talk about Los Angeles history, which everyone knows is one of my personal hobbies. And we'll try to figure out if there's an angle in there for labor law. Now, as somebody who has studied Los Angeles history my entire life, I've come to the conclusion that there are very few people out there who, if they had not existed, we wouldn't have LA as we know it. And I don't mean a coronavirus infested town. I mean the great city of Los Angeles that became a world-class city not too long ago, but was a major city before then. The people I want to talk about are the man who donated the land to Griffith Park. And I also want to talk about Isaac Hellman, who is the financier of the West, who probably most of you have never heard of. I will talk briefly about the Chandlers of the Los Angeles Times that were the boosters of the city. And I will mention William Mulholland, although I don't feel that the city wouldn't be where it is without him. I think another city engineer would have designed an aqueduct. So I want to take you back in time. I want to take you back in time to a different century and a myth about Los Angeles. There's some myths about Los Angeles, not just one, but I find this to be one of the most fascinating myths about Los Angeles. And I used to think it changed the course of how Los Angeles was developed, but I think more so the donation of Griffith Park did. And so some years back, I would spend a lot of my time researching the Los Feliz curse. Have you ever heard of that? Well, Griffith Park was cursed land. I even wrote a novel called Legend of the Lizard People, which mixed together three of Los Angeles's most famous myths, one of which was the Cursed Ranch. So we're going to go back to 1784, a time in which the Spanish government began making land grants. These grants of land became known as various ranchos, ranchos. The names of these ranches exist today in street names and the names of cities. For instance, you've probably heard of San Fernando. Well, that was Rancho San Fernando. So on March 22nd, 1843, a grant was made by the then Mexican governor to Maria Y. G. N. A. C. I. O. Verdugo, a name you've probably heard of in Glendale, of a tract of land known as Los Feliz Rancho. Rancho Los Feliz became one of the numerous ranchos of the year. Once California became a state, the grant got confirmed by the United States. Being one of the later ranches to have existence through a land grant, Los Feliz, Rancho Los Feliz, was one of the smaller land grants. Much of it was through a hilly section that today I think we know as Griffith Park. However, the Los Angeles River ran through the rancho And it was within reasonable distance to the Pueblo. That's the city down there by Olvera Street. Major Horace Bell is a name you hear in Los Angeles history. And he's one of my favorites. Although I think he might have been a little bit anti-Semitic. And we know what I am. Well, Major Horace Bell was also a lawyer. He claimed he was, well, living in mud huts, whipping people or almost getting killed by whips, all kinds of crazy things. He lived from 1830 to 1918, and he was, like I said, an early member of the Los Angeles Bar. He was a lawyer like me. And Georgia was his wife, and she is the namesake to Georgia Street in downtown Los Angeles, where if you listen to Dragnet, you'd always hear about the Georgia Street Hospital. And we made some jokes about that back on episode 84 of this show. You can find on the Carl Gerber with a K channel on YouTube in a very popular episode called Hunt for the Soldier's Genital. Mother's phone sex operator and ASMR porn legend makes genitals. Well, it was crazy. And we actually went to Jack Webb's house. It's not far 
from Employment Lawyers Group, and that's the house he had when he was doing Dragnet in Studio City. He later moved to Encino, but we are getting a little bit sidetracked. We're going to go now and talk more about Horace Bell, who had a newspaper called The Porcupine between 1882 and 1888. Most historians attribute the Las Feliz curse to Bell. Some people um, think that Griffith, W. Griffith, told him the tale. That's the man who wanted to get rid of the land, or was it Griffith, J. Griffith? Now I'm confused. Well, at any rate, the tale has elements of the displaced Californian families and the ranches lost to loan sharks which was a big thing going on. Um, these Spanish families that were pre-California got their land grants, and unfortunately, they started getting into loans, and the loans had users interest rates, and that's how all these great California ranches were lost. There's just a whole series of them. Los Feliz is not the only one. Plummer, where you can go to the park in West Hollywood, there's Plummer Park, he claims that there were loans and that's how they lost a lot of that ranch and so on and so forth, including Hancock's land was where the tar pits are now. And that probably was lost to the Hancocks because of loans. So most of these had loan problems. But anyways, Los Feliz was one of the greatest ranches of Los Angeles County. It was described as the most fertile of the parks, one of the grandest, the springs of water, the coolest and most limpid. Well, that's by Horace Bell, and I don't know how accurate that is. He told us that the vineyards were the most productive, the meadows the greenest, and the cattle the fattest. He described the rancho as the liveliest and most romantic property in Southern California. I don't know if that's true. Anyways, he got into the story of loan sharking. And he claimed that there was Don Antonio Feliz who becomes indebted to Jew Solomon. You know, we got to call him Jew. That's not very nice for $16. And then, I don't know, I guess that was supposed to be a lot of money. This is the same Don Antonio Felix who had money in good hard silver and gold coins. So I don't know how this prosperous man would have become indebted for $16 and lost his whole ranch. But um, at any rate, that's what we're told. And we're told one day in 1863, Don Antonio Feliz, and there's some questions about who was with him, but at any rate, he caught smallpox. And by one o'clock, he was speechless. I guess smallpox was a problem back in Los Angeles back then. And at 3 o'clock p.m., his best friend, lawyer, Don Antonio Cornell, the first mayor of Los Angeles, once it was part of California, comes to the ranch and proceeds to write. And witness Don Sente, finally somebody other than Antonio. Everyone's been called Antonio in this story. And um, this man, Don Antonio Feliz, is allegedly speechless for hours before the will was written. So it, it couldn't have been dictated by the master of the ranch. Claims were made that the will was written by Dan Antonio Felis by nodding his head in assent to the terms of the last testament. Well, there are also claims that his head was propped up on the bed and somebody was moving it to assent to the terms and this man was already dead. Okay, so allegedly during this bequeath where everything has been given away, possibly from a dead Spanish Juan. There is a bequest of 12 gentle mares with pinto stallions, a colt for each mare for Los Feliz's godson Juan Sanchez, household furniture divided equally between Los Feliz's sister-in-law and the true riches of a verdant ranch, um, evidently not encumbered by the big $16 Jew loan, were bequeathed to Don Antonio Cornell. Cornell had the option of selling everything for a price he sought fit when he sought fit. Well, that doesn't sound good. And again, this loan seems quite inconsequential if there's all this stuff. You know, what, what's going on here? Why is the ranch being lost over a $16 loan? A myth, probably not what happened. But 
Bell claimed this was the start of a great downfall in this canard. Now, this element of the story is certainly anti-Semitic. And here's the thing. We're going to talk about Isaiah's Hellman, who wasn't yet operating the first bank in Los Angeles with um, a required non-Jew until 1868. Yeah, there was a problem with Isaiah's Hellman actually running a bank because he was Jewish. And so his partner was the former mayor of, not the mayor, I'm sorry, the governor of California, Downey. But anyways, um, Solomon Lazard, who wasn't really the first banker, he opened a deposit window out of his store in 1859. Allegedly, he founded this private bank called Lazard, F-R-E-R-E-S and Company. And um, by the way, that that is a huge financial concern now. Lazard married Joseph Newmark's daughter, and Joseph Newmark is the founder of Los Angeles' first temple, and you'll hear more about that later in this episode. It's Congregation B'nai B'rath, and it's known as the Wilshire Boulevard Temple. But at any rate, according to Bell, Don Antonio Los Feliz was a bachelor who lived with his sister and Pentranilla, a niece who was raised like a daughter. And in all my years of looking into this myth, I've never found a picture of Donna Petrilana. We're talking about the curse, the Las Feliz curse, which is going to be instrumental in changing Los Angeles history if you just tuned in. This is the Gerber Workplace Lawyer, Carl Gerber. I'm a real workplace lawyer. I'm also a historian. Well, at any rate, this beautiful lady, Petrilana, came back from the Pueblo once the smallpox contagion was over. She's back at Rancho Los Feliz. She's 17 years old. She's described as a fairy-like creature who was tall, slim, graceful, and beautiful, and educated, but possessing a fiery spirit. Old the new master, Cornell. The one shall die an untimely death, the other in blood and violence. A blight shall fall upon the face of his terrestrial paradise. The cattle shall no longer fatten, but sicken on its own pastures. The field shall not longer respond to the tiller. The grand oak shall wither and die. Persons um, other than Bell inserted something about tongues and flames. And the wrath of heaven and vengeance of hell shall fall upon this place in the floods. So what place is that? That's Griffith Park, right? And that's Rancho Los Feliz. And now things get a little dicey. At this point, a myriad of demons could be seen floating in the air like vultures. In the general vicinity of the Tahangas, where the sun could be seen sinking below the Tahangas. Petrolana! the utter horror of these demons riding storm clouds lashing the clouds of the vaqueros lash cattle there was darkness rolling thunder flashes of lightning and rain falling in torrents boulders grinded and crashed this is griffith park mind you the royal oak was destroyed oaks withered in tongues of flames the meadows were gone and ran she proclaimed no man would ever enjoy a profit from the rancho. Misfortune, rhyme, and death will follow. This curse sucked all the life out of frail Petronelia, and she died on a tiled floor of cloister-like veranda. Petrolana rose briefly to speak to a priest after she died. Sounds like Anita Orca Helms, who was just told the devil was tempting her. This is the myth of the Los Feliz curse on the Carl Gerber Workplace Lawyer Show. For unexplained reasons, Don Antonio Cornell allegedly transferred the land to his lawyer, and this appears untrue. Again, this is Horace Bell, who was a lawyer writing for the Porcupine newspaper in the 1800s. In 1868, Cornell sold the portion of the ranch he did not own before Don Antonio Feliz allegedly died, well, okay, for $10,000 to Charles V. Howard. Horace Bell reported that for $8,000, the water rights in the springs passed to the Los Angeles Water Company. Now, again, this is a ranch that was left over or lost over a $16 debt to um, a, a lender. And, and this, so I, I don't think it was lost to a lender. And it's just some anti-Semitism here. 
Then we get um, Leon, a.k.a. Lucky Baldwin. Ever heard of Baldwin Hills? Well, that's Lucky Baldwin. He's certainly a colorful California figure. This is a gigantic man and um, not gigantic in height. He's a horseman. And he came on a wagon train barefoot from from the east. And he was robbed by Brigham Young, who you may have heard of. He started a university in Nevada before settling in San Francisco when he purchased the ranch. We're talking about the Rancho Los Feliz, which is Griffith Park. And much was spent on improvements, including a no, new home for Baldwin's brother. General John M. Baldwin, was he a real general? Probably not. Everyone goes around with these titles, Ben. That the ranch was overrun by grasshoppers, which caused all the cattle to die. And Lucky Baldwin, a man, by the way, who died with a $20 million fortune not long, much long after the century, was forced to mortgage the ranch. I doubt Lucky Baldwin had a mortgage his ranch. Um, his fortune when he died 25 years later would be considered a billion dollars today. But you have to keep in mind that nobody had a billion dollars when Lucky Baldwin died. So this man was very rich. I don't think he was forced to mortgage Griffith Park. Um, I don't see it. But at any rate, in 1879, there was a brush fire in this land. And Thomas Bell purchased the land after John M. Baldwin left. And John M. Baldwin was later murdered by Mexican bandits. So the curse is following this ranch. In December of 1882, Colonel, he's not a real Colonel, Griffith J. Griffith, not Griffith W., but Griffith J., he's not the movie person. He buys the land, which by this time is, you know, the hilly section of Griffith Park. It's still 4,071 acres. And Horace Bell claims that Griffith was a Welsh prince. I don't know about that. Griffith was born on a farm, which kept him slightly better off than destitute, I've read. So I don't know how he was a prince. But in 1884, again, there was an unprecedented electric storm due to thunder. The best part of the ranch was swept away to the sea. Ooh, presumably all in the uh, narrow streams that travel through Griffith Park and enter the ocean almost 40 miles away in Long Beach. This night was referred to as the Great Crescenta. The ghost of Don Antonio Fieles was seen along with demons who were plainly riding the waves and directing torrents onto the land. Baron Griffith, now he's a baron, escaped to town at midnight. Griffith was able to rent a small corner of the ranch that had not been destroyed. And this is roughly where the merry-go-rounds are. If you ever rode the merry grounds you've probably heard that music. And that music is very old. It's from about 1908, just out of interest. But back to Griffith Park after Griffith gets it, and he's got just a small corner of the ranch which hasn't been destroyed. And that's roughly where the merry go round is. He's got a tenant that operated an ostrich ranch. Visitors came into the area to spectate the ostriches. Now, I don't know if this tenant had any connection to Remus Helms, the most important man in Sun Valley, California, who operates a cosplay ostrich ranch not far from Tahunga's and happens to be a long-standing sponsor of the Carl Gerber Workplace Lawyer Show with his $5.14 billion in funding and 14 inches of endowment. Yes, Remus Helms, a frequent character on this program. Anyways, back to the Las Feliz curse, which is Griffith Park. Horrid things continued on the ranch, including two men who arrived young but left with gray hair. There were frequent hauntings at a festivity to entice city officials to take the ranch of a gift. The ghost of Antonio Felis seated himself in Griffith's chair, my God. He then invited the guests to dine with him in hell. Why Don Antonio Felis went to hell? Well, 
I don't know. That's not really explained. He wasn't supposed to be a bad man. But in 1903, the curse was blamed when a temporarily insane Griffith convinced his wife was conspiring against him. And he shot her in the face on the roof of the Arcadia Hotel in Santa Monica, where she lived. He was convicted and served a three-year term in San Quentin. He never reconciled with his wife. Now, if you would like to see pictures of what this all looks like, you can go to employeelaw.com backslash vintage LA, and I've got all kinds of old pictures of all these people, Don Antonio Fialas, Griffith Park, the whole thing. You are still listening to the Carl Gerber Workplace Lawyer Show, and we're still talking about Griffith Park and the Cursed Ranch. Now, for significantly more than 10 years, Griffith tried to unload the ranch on the city of Los Angeles. Many speculated he couldn't sell the ranch, and he sought out the bequest of the tax write-off. However, during at least part of this time, he was selling off parts of the ranch for sizable profits, notwithstanding it being cursed. Others believed he wanted to unload the ranch due to the curse. After he was released from prison, many believed he was intent on gifting the land to Los Angeles to try to get his name back, which had been thoroughly ruined when he shot his wife in the face, and I thought, always thought he poked her eyes out in the hotel in Santa Monica. Not until February 18, 1910, did Griffith Park become property of Los Angeles. Some believe that Los Angeles' only interest in the acquisition were the Los Angeles River water that passed through the park. Van Griffith, Griffith J. Griffith's son, was instrumental in building the park and providing adequate funding. In 1913, Griffith J. Griffith volunteered to provide funding for an observatory. And a lot of people were claiming the city was very slow to act because Griffith J. Griffin had a lot of ill repute. In 1929, there was a disastrous fire in Griffith Park and then a flooding. In 1933, there were nine men who died in another Griffith Park fire. The myth of the cursed ranch lived on. The park flooded in 1934 and 1938 after the 1938 uh, flood of Los Angeles River. The river had to be covered in concrete, and that's why it's concrete now. By 1977, the Hillside Strangler worked the area, instilling fear in everyone hiking in the park. In 1979, I suffered my first significant bee sting while drinking a lemon-lime soda by the observatory. And again, if you go to employeelawca.com backslash vintage LA, you can see some vintage pictures of this. Now, I want to mention an interesting fact that I personally remember because I was listening to TV this day, October 10th, 1985. I think everyone refers to it as the pendulum that's down there in Griffith Park Observatory, kind of when you walk in, and it's called the F-O-U-C-A-U-L-T, a Foucault. Well, I just kind of find this to be an interesting little piece of Hollywood because there is nothing like Hollywood like the Griffith Park Observatory. But the day that the pendulum stopped spinning because of Vandal, well, that's the same way Orson Welles died. He died that day, same day. Orson Welles, as we all know, had the most frightening broadcast ever on radio that people thought was real. And then he went on to make a movie that a lot of people thought Consider the greatest movie ever made. So when that pendulum stopped swinging, I, I don't know, maybe that just took the life out of Hollywood. Personal experience, back in 2006, I wrote The Legend of the Lizard People, and it was set in 1939, and Pentralina was supposed to be a very old woman who held magical Mayan lizards, little pieces of, of like jewelry, and she gave him to a barrister named Clover Shiner when the court forced him to represent her on a land claim. And the deed 
becomes an issue. And deeds are in Los Angeles history. And I was able to mix her inheritance to myth number two of Los Angeles, which is the cursed treasure buried on the Coanga Pass, not far from the Hollywood Bowl. And then we had the Mayan thing and the Mayan catacombs underneath downtown Los Angeles. That's myth number three, one of my favorites. And my book has us, or my characters, going into these tunnels that really do exist in downtown Los Angeles, but they were more so for streetcars. And I don't really know if Mayans were using these tunnels ever to have religious practices, but um, the the lizard that was magical, like magical realism, unlocked the grand room of treasure at the end of the Mayan catacombs under downtown Los Angeles at the end of the book. So that is the curse of Los Feliz Ranch. And I think, as someone who's lived in Los Angeles many, many years, I think that had the land not been donated to the city of Los Angeles, our city would have developed differently. And that's why I think that this crazy man, Griffith J. Griffith's donation to the city is so significant. Now, if you know anything about Los Angeles history, it was westward bound. We start out in East LA or downtown and we just keep moving west. And by, oh, 1910, I mean, there's still some people living by Vermont and Wilshire, not far from where Bullock's Wilshire was. That's where the rich were living, maybe even until 1930. There were grand homes on Wilshire Boulevard. Then they were knocked down and they became commercial through Gaylord Wilshire, who was a real estate agent who did one lot at a time to change the fact that Wilshire Boulevard was zoned for residences. But... You keep moving to Vermont, and we know you get to Vermont Avenue at Wilshire, and you go north, you know, you're going to hit Los Feliz, and you're going to hit Griffith Park. And certainly by the 20s, or even probably 1915, very influential people started moving into Los Feliz. Um, I do believe that the Chandlers lived there, who owned Los Angeles Times, a lot of people were moving there. And I think if Griffith Park didn't become a public park like it is, I think it would have become canyons like Coldwater Canyon and Beverly Glen and Laurel Canyon that feed a certain part of the San Fernando Valley that had become very populated. And there's actually more, or was before the coronavirus, more TV and film production there than most people would ever imagine. We have CBS Radford in Studio City. Most of Burbank is post-production, animation. Same with North Hollywood. Um, But we have Beverly Hills, which connects by Coldwater Canyon, which goes to Studio City. And so the movement was westward, and it went to Beverly Hills instead of that Vermont area. I mean... Beverly Hills was all right in like 1919, but it really wasn't much. You had Fairbanks and Pickford living there. It was pretty rural, and it really, those canyons were almost worthless for many years, Bennett Canyon included. So it took a long time for those canyons to become expensive and have massive homes there. And I believe that that would have happened in Griffith Park. It wouldn't have been Ben in a canyon. It would have been Coldwater. It wouldn't have been Beverly Glen, the Sherman Oaks. It, it would have been the Griffith Park area. And that's where all the people that were upper middle class or some wealthy people would live there. And I think that Burbank and Glendale would have a different demeanor to it if Griffith Park didn't become a public park. Whether it became a public park because Griffith, J. Griffith, was just trying to get on the better side of Los Angeles again, well, probably that's a big part of what happened. Was he concerned about a curse? I don't know. There were a lot of bad things that happened there. 
there were a lot of fires, there are still a lot of fires, and lightning, you know, back then when there was less metal, maybe it was striking these trees, it it just wasn't a worthwhile place, and I don't really know how great the farming would be there, because you can see the you go on hikes. I know a lot about soil doing hillside development and construction, and you can see the soil is bedrock. The trails that they've chiseled out, they've chiseled out bedrock. Bedrock is real hard. Some of it there is withered and it gets a little flaky, but you can't farm in that stuff, and it's just a bunch of hills. And so I don't really think that that was great farmland. I don't think it was a great place. Maybe the lower portions were closer to where the freeway is, but a lot of that um, is mountains and hills and would have been great for residential homes, mid-century homes, homes hanging off cliffs, maybe mansions on each side and foothills, but I don't think it, it would have been as valuable as Bell made out in his myth. And um, you know maybe for a while it would have been a writing academy, but the best thing was for it to become the great park of Los Angeles. And it is a great park. It's like, you know, in New York, they have a great park. Well, our great park is Griffith Park. And it's big and has a lot going on there. And some of what's gone on has changed, but I just believe that that grant that he made, the criminal man really did change how Los Angeles came out. Okay, so we've been talking for a while. I think we actually need to go to break, and we're going to do that. So these commercials will be interesting. Boxes everywhere will have something to sing and dance about because that's when Crocker Bank's interest checking statements will show the extra money earned in Crocker's new interest checking accounts. That's right, a new service that pays interest on your checking account. Not even savings and loans can pay you more. So come on in to Crocker and sign up now. Your bank statement won't have pleased you or your mailbox this much in a long time. Since 1993, the Employment Lawyers Group has been a results-oriented law firm whose goal is to get the client what they deserve. They've represented thousands of California employees who've lost their jobs, been sexually harassed, subjected to employment discrimination, or were owed wages on an individualized or group basis, such as a class action. They have a high rate of success. There are few situations involving employment law that they have not confronted. At the forefront of employee rights, they're often the first employee law firm to confront a new legal issue. For an experienced employment lawyer call 877-525-0700 that's 877-525-0700 they have call takers standing by online read more about the firm at employeelawca.com they have offices throughout southern california make your work problem theirs to solve Does anybody remember Crocker Bank? Well, I do, and that's going to be our segue on the Carl Gerber Workplace Lawyer Show to what we're talking about next. We're going to talk about a man that I think without him, we wouldn't have Los Angeles. And there are only a couple people I can say that about. Very, very few. And I don't know how many of you have heard of this guy named Mr. Hellman. First name, I-S-A-I-A-S, Isaias. Well, he didn't land in Los Angeles until 1859. It's a long time ago. He was born in 1842 in Bavaria. He was Jewish. Maybe that's why a lot of people haven't heard about him. A steamer brought him and his brother, Herman, to San Pedro in 1859. But Penis, or Penis Banning's barge, brought them to shore. Penis Bang... What is this, Remus Helms? Uh, <laughs> Penis Banning? Well, that's his name. Um, You've heard of Banning, California. 
if there was no Mr. Banning and his silver mines, that's the other one I got to tell you. I don't think there'd be a Los Angeles because Los Angeles served basically as the supply station for these silver mines all the way out in Banning, California. And without that, we wouldn't have had stores. We wouldn't be selling anything. So he's actually very important. But, um, you know, he just had a barge that brought Mr. Hellman and his brother to San Pedro. And two hours later, at the cost of $20 in 1859, a Conestoga wagon delivered Herman and Isaias to the Pueblo, which is the city, which is Los Angeles, where we know it now by Alvaro Street. In 1859, there were 4,000 accounted for residents in Los Angeles. Imagine coming into town in 1859, Los Angeles. Probably there were mud huts back there in the Pueblo. Banning took a liking to Isaias, who was learning to speak English, and invited him to stay in his home. Oh, I'd like to be there. Still, in 1859, Isaias began sleeping on a cot in his cousin's store while learning the dry goods business. By 1865, he had considerably improved his cousin's store while becoming fluent in English and Spanish. If you didn't speak Spanish in Los Angeles in 1865, I think you had a problem. Kind of the same now. Well, that year, 1865, that's the end of the Civil War, Isaiah's paid $525 for a dry goods store on Commercial and Main Street. He put another $1,000 into upgrading the store. Although many of the upgrades were lavish for a frontier town, which was Los Angeles, one upgrade changed history. Isaiah Hellman invested $160, that was a lot of money then, for a Tilden and McFarland safe, which he placed on the counter to demonstrate stability. This is a technique this man used throughout his life very effectively. The dry goods store also had a scale to measure gold dust and nuggets that were coming in. Now, Isaiah soon began allowing Angelinos to store gold and other valuables in his safe. Safety deposit boxes and banks did not exist yet in Los Angeles. By 1867, Isaiah's Hellman safe in his little dry goods store contained $200,000. That would be $32 million today. Some of this money belonged to people like Miguel Lennis. Have you heard of the Lennis abode in the valley? William Workman. Have you heard of the Workman Ranch? Now, David Workman was a judge. I had one of my first jury trials in front of him. He was a descendant. He died very recently. At any rate, Isaiah's safe was particularly handy because the only other option was to use Wells Fargo to ship gold coin by stage to San Francisco. This cost money, posed risk, and led to long delays in order to get one's money back. Isaiah didn't impose any charge for the use of his safe. We're talking 1867, people. Things changed when a rate Irish miner who regularly kept his money in the safe and made withdrawals came to withdraw the last of his money. The, and I'm going to say it, and I can say it because this is me. The miner called Isaiah a dirty Jew, something we don't like to be called. I don't know how often that happened in 1867, but I bet it did. He accused Isaiah of stealing his gold, and he lunged at him. A friend calmed down the miner by reminding him he used his money to gamble and drink. But Isaiah decided he'd have to set up formal banking functions. He went to the printer and ordered deposit and withdrawal slips labeled I.W. Hellman Banker and became the first banker of Los Angeles. And I'm not going to say that other people were actually bankers before him in Los Angeles because I think he was the first. Now, 
Former Governor John Downey opened the first official bank of Los Angeles in 1868, shortly before Isaiah officially opened the bank in Los Angeles. But I don't think it had $32 million in it. And you're going to hear more about Downey in this episode 108 of the Carl Gerber Workplace Lawyer Show, where tonight we're talking about Los Angeles history and very few men who made Los Angeles, and without them, we would not have Los Angeles. So in 1867, Herman Hellman, remember the brother who came with Isaiah, he dropped the Ann on his name, and um, he became Hellman, not Hellman, and he opened his own shop, which today goes by Smart and Final, if you've ever heard of that. By 1867, Isaiah was one of the 30 richest Angelinos. And he wasn't very old then. You can do the math. He was 25 years old. In 1868, his bank moved out of his store and into a partnership called Hellman Temple and Company. By this time, Temple, as in the Temple Street, maybe you've heard of where Court is. He was married to Workman's daughter. And the bank's customers included Garrity for this. Don Pio Pico, California's first governor. Diego Sepulveda. Yeah, he's a member of the Sepulveda family who owned the large portion of Santa Ana and Costa Mesa. So everyone's really doing business at Isaiah's bank. Now, Isaiah becomes a land speculator like everyone in Los Angeles did for many years and I think still does. In 1863, he bought his first lot in the outskirts of town, which was Hope and 7th Street. Hmm, Hope Street seems to have uh, some pretty tall buildings on it now. I don't think that's the outskirts anymore. By 1869, he was involved in most of the large-scale land purchases in Los Angeles as either a lender or a purchaser. This guy is pretty damn young by then, okay? Keep in mind, too, he's not even 30. Around this time, he bought this first vineyard of his near the Los Angeles River, and by turn of the century, he sat on the California Wine Board. A two-story building Isaiah erected in 1870 can be seen if you check out vintagelosangeles.org or employeelawca.com backslash vintage LA, all one word. All right, so in 1868, Hellman Temple and Company was opened in a small building left of the Bella Union Hotel. So he's got to operate a bank, but he's not able to be in charge of it because he's Jewish. And there'd be too many anti-Semitic things said, I suppose. So the story with Isaacs goes on. In 1870, he marries Esther, whose older sister was married to Meyer Lehman a Bavarian cotton grower who started a firm called Lehman Brothers. Have you ever heard of them? Okay, so in 1871, Isaiah recruited John Downey to form Farmers and Merchants Bank. And although Isaiah ran the bank, Downey was the official president because Isaiah feared there'd be outlash if the figurehead of the bank was Jewish. And Downey was incompetent, by the way. He just loaned money to everyone, and he didn't know how to do it. And um, our star here, Isaiah Hellman, did. And you're going to hear more about who he loaned money to. But by 1871, he's instrumental in funding Los Angeles' first gas, electric, and water companies. Hmm. And his wife, Esther, becomes involved in the Ladies Hebrew Benevolent Society, which raised money for Los Angeles' first synagogue in 1872. We heard about Newmark a couple minutes ago on the show. This synagogue may have been the first Reformed temple in California. Rabbi Edelman allowed men and women to sit together while some of their prayers were in English, neither of which is allowed during traditional Jewish prayer. If you've ever been to an Orthodox temple, men and women do not sit together and the women sit behind curtains. So pretty important that he's involved in this too. By 1872, Isaac's work with Leland Stanford. Have you heard of him? 
he um, was going to make sure the Southern Pacific Railroad came through Los Angeles and not San Diego. And Leland Stanford is Stanford University, if you didn't know, and he is the railroad. So um, wasn't for Isaiah, so I don't think the railroad would have come through Los Angeles. So it would have gone to San Diego. And there was a lot going on during this time about ports and, and whether San Diego would become the big city or L.A. would. So a similar situation with the port occurs in which many Los Angeles historians credit the rise to the port being here in San Pedro and Long Beach area, Wilmington, and not San Diego. And our income from the port in Los Angeles is enormous. And as a workplace lawyer, that's a big deal. I represent a lot of people that work for the Chevron refineries and the ports and all that in the area. In 1875, Isaiah developed the dominant trolley system in Los Angeles, which allowed the city to spread out. Remember westward expansion? The same year he bought out a place called Rancho Cucamonga. Have you heard of that? Yeah, that's in San Bernardino. And I guess in the 30s or 40s, Jack Benning was making jokes about that. But now that's a big city in the Inland Empire, not very far from the Ontario office of the Employment Lawyers Group. In 1875, there was a run on the Bank of California in Serendisco due to decline in the silver industry. Silver, penis banning, yes, his silver mines, and all that stuff about whether we're going to have silver, gold. Well, anyways, there was also a lot of land speculation in California. There was a panic in the east. This caused a run on Isaiah's bank and its closure for four days. But Meyer Lehman and Lehman Brothers wired Isaiah $20,000, which he turned into gold and stacked up on the counters of his bank to demonstrate they were solvent. And future withdrawals did not happen in Isaiah's bank with the gold on the counters. The only other bank in Los Angeles um, went out of business, and a financial disaster in Los Angeles was diverted by Isaiah Hellman. Sensing the movement of the city in 1876, Isaiah purchased thousands of acres in southwest Los Angeles. In 1879, Methodists were looking for land to use for their new university. Isaiah donated the land upon which the University of Southern California opened in 1880. California's governor was so impressed with Isaiah's donation, he made Isaiah a regent of the University of California. In 1878, he became a one-third owner in Rancho Los Alamitos, hmm, which happened to include Signal Hill. Now, that's where all the oil is near Long Beach. And it's a pretty large oil producer. He'd also purchased the Rancho San Pedro. Well, that's where the port is now, isn't it? In 1883, Hardison and Stewart owed considerable amount of debt to others. And they were looking for oil, and they had not hit a gusher. And they were $183,000 in debt back in 1883. So I told you Isaiah was a pretty good uh, foreseer of who could pay their loans back. He made these two gentlemen a $10,000 loan. Hardison and Stewart is known today as Unical. Um, have you heard of Union of 76? In 1882, Isaias loans Mr. Otis $18,000 to buy out a certain Los Angeles newspaper called The Times. Otis and his son-in-law, Harry Chandler, are the third men that I would credit as being, without them, there is no Los Angeles as we know it. They were the boosters as Los Angeles for years. They were members of the original syndicate, which owned the San Fernando Valley and made the land sell in 1911. And we know the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion comes from a Chandler, but she's really, I think, Buffum Chandler. She's married. But that's our music center. That's our first one. Um, God put the Chandlers in as being there. But and back to Isaiah Hellman, who seriously, without him, there would be no West. In 1890, he moves to Serendisco. Lucky Baldwin, who we talked about earlier in the show, is up there too sometimes. Some of these guys go back and forth. 
Well, Isaiah takes over the Bank of Nevada, followed by the Union Trust Company in 1893. In 1893, he prevented financial ruin in both Los Angeles and Serendisco by stocking gold coins on the counter to the banks where he kept larger reserves than others. Although he relocates to Serendisco, he maintains significant interest in Los Angeles. In 1893, he loaned a gentleman named Mr. Doheny, new partner, um, $500 to find oil working underneath Los Angeles. And uh, uh, this is um, Mr. Doheny, as in the Doheny Estates in Beverly Hills, as um, you know, one of the major oil magnets. So this guy now is pretty much loaning money to anyone that became anything in oil. In 1893, he provides a $50,000 loan to build the break wall for the creation of the San Pedro Harbor. Again, how much of our economy is based on that? Pretty big. Bradley wanted us to become a major port city. Bradley went to my law school. And that's when Los Angeles changed its demeanor from being just a nice big city that was mostly white to being an international city. And the port continues to be a major reason why Los Angeles is a world-class city, by the way. So in 1898, Isaiah Hellman establishes the Los Angeles Railway with Henry Edwards Huntington. Uh, maybe you've heard of him, um, Huntington, as in um, a little museum they have down there, uh, you know, Santa Maria, Santa Maria, San Marino, that is. In 1901, the two established the Pacific Electric Railway which ultimately spanned from downtown Los Angeles to the sea and served as the streetcar company in Los Angeles. Esther died in 1908. Now, I wanted to have music that is real music from the era. And this song... Oh, well, it's baseball season and nobody's playing baseball right now. But that song came out in 1908. That's when Isaiah Hellman's beloved Esther died. And remember that they had some cousins on her side with Lehman, of the Lehman Brothers. But Isaiah dies in 1920. And at different times, the couple's son and grandson became the president of Wells Fargo Bank and... I think you heard a little bit about Crocker Bank on our commercial. Um, all of these banks of his, Wells Fargo, Nevada National Bank, Union Trust, they all became Wells Fargo. And the Farmers and National Bank, which was his first, became Security Pacific, which I remember living in Los Angeles. That got bought out by Bank of America. And some speculate there's been a lack of interest in Isaiah Hellman because he was Jewish. And notwithstanding his importance in Los Angeles, California, and San Francisco, little has been written about him. There's a great book one of his ancestors wrote called Towers of Gold. You should read it. I did. And to some extent, he was in the right place at the right time. But I don't think somebody else could have made loans to Union Oil to save them so they could become Union Oil. And all the things he did, just, it's unbelievable. And there's so much more that I didn't even tell you about. And um, I guess he was, he was a good banker. And he wasn't the banker that was making these usurious loans to those people with the Spanish land grants. He wasn't doing that. Those were some other bankers that weren't real bankers or just not very scrupulous. So that wasn't how he got rich. He got rich with knowing who to loan money to, which is a talent that not everybody has. All right, you're listening to the Carl Gerber Workplace Lawyer Show. I'm Carl Gerber. I'm a real workplace lawyer. Tonight, we've talked a lot about Los Angeles history. I did want to play a couple other songs for you that historically are just completely accurate okay um so this song here is from 1902 
That song is not from 1975 when The Sting came out. This song is from 1859 and I'm about to play and that's what you would have heard when Isaiah Hellman was coming to Los Angeles, coming into Los Angeles as I should say. I promised you I'd say something about William Mulholland. We all know that Los Angeles doesn't have enough water, but um, William Mulholland was a municipal engineer, and I think somebody else would have come up with an aqueduct system to steal all the water from the Owens Valley. I don't think it had to be Mulholland. And Mulholland, we also know, didn't design another project very well, and it caused a great flood, killing tons of people in Ventura County along the road that is the back route called the 126. And so, um, you know, I think he's important because the aqueduct had to happen. We needed more water. And the cities had their own water supplies. And some, Beverly Hills did for a long time. The water wasn't very good. But I just, I don't know that I would put him in the same category as Isaiah Hellman. I think that Griffith, Jay Griffith changes the city. I think the Chandler's, are incredible boosters. I think they're into this whole thing where the land is being sold. There's westward expansion. Los Angeles is going to have culture. Los Angeles is going to be viewed as an important city. They're really, their paper was what Los Angeles needed for that. And some of that time, the newspaper was the only thing. There was no TV. There was no radio. And Los Angeles Times was very important in making Los Angeles a world-class city. So as you know, I am a real workplace lawyer. I am always hoping people call me if they have a real case where they've been fired from their job. Maybe they were sexually harassed, class actions were their own wages. I can be reached at 877-525-0700. That's 877-525-0700. Five two five zero seven hundred during normal business hours, nine to about six thirty. We're even taking calls these days. Eight seven seven five two five zero seven hundred. If you're anywhere in California, we have a lot of offices throughout California, not just in Los Angeles. I do hope you've enjoyed this show. Um, as you know, we're not broadcasting live at any radio station right now because of the coronavirus. And we expect the show to move back into more of the live broadcast on an FM station once this coronavirus thing is over with. But this is not a time in which I'm able to produce a quality show with multiple voice actors and actresses because we have to do those on Zoom and people have laggy internet and it's just not the way to go. And these days, you know, we're all doing our own cleaning and I'm answering all the phones at the Employment Lawyers Group, and there's just less time to put together shows like that. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you didn't think it was too boring and specific about Los Angeles, but that is my hobby. I do encourage you to check out the vintage websites I maintain, such as Los Angeles, vintagelosangeles.org or employeelaw, all one word, dot com backslash vintage LA. I have shared a lot of my rare images, maps, pictures, what I have, phone books, all kinds of things, and knowledge about Los Angeles and what I think are the more interesting stories about Los Angeles. And when I do shows like this, um, I look at the Carl Gerber with the K channel on YouTube on those shows, and I do notice that people watch 40% or 100% of a show when it's about this sort of Los Angeles topic. So I know there is an audience for that. And um, it's hard to do because it is very factually specific. And if the show is black and white, like tonight, where we're talking about things that happened 100 years ago or more, they're quite frankly less people interested in that kind of serious Los Angeles history. Most people want the color days where we've got color pictures and something kind of like within their lifetimes, like there used to be swimming pool stores all over Ventura Boulevard in the 50s and 60s, or Marine Land, or something that you know everyone knows used to be there that isn't there anymore, that's very exciting, and they have fond memories. So um, that stuff, I really get a kick out of, I, I really enjoy it, but um, it's just, 
the interest in the hardcore historic facts is a little bit different like what you've been hearing about tonight. So I hope you've enjoyed the show. This is the Carl Gerber Workplace Lawyer Show. I'm Carl Gerber. In real life, I do represent employees. This is episode 108. You should go back on the Carl Gerber with the K channel on YouTube. We view old episodes and um, I just want to make sure I'm keeping in touch with everyone until the show is regularly being broadcast live on radio in Los Angeles after the coronavirus is over with. And um, so again, I I hope you've enjoyed this and I hope you have a wonderful week of workplace abuse. But if you do, I think you know where to call. Since 1993, the Employment Lawyers Group has been a results-oriented law firm whose goal is to get the client what they deserve. They've represented thousands of California employees who've lost their jobs, been sexually harassed, subjected to employment discrimination, or were owed wages on an individualized or group basis, such as a class action. They have a high rate of success. There are few situations involving employment law that they have not confronted. At the forefront of employee rights, they're often the first employee law firm to confront a new legal issue. For an experienced employment lawyer call 877-525-0700 that's 877-525-0700 they have call taker standing by online read more about the firm at employeelawca.com they have offices throughout southern california make your work problem theirs to solve